from our Singapore studios. Rajiv, thank you very much. And I must say, uh, Rajiv, it's a pleasure to talk to you. You're one of the few economists out there who doesn't uh, mince words. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, shoot Behind for the target. Thank Prashant. you very much. Uh, I would like your uh, thoughts first, Rajiv, on uh, the, uh, the report that we put out yesterday that uh, the government uh, is essentially considering a proposal uh, for a weaker rupee, right? I mean, essentially a devaluation as far as the rupee is concerned. It's just a proposal, mind you, nothing firm, but at least they're formally starting discussions around this. What are your thoughts on this, Rajiv? Well, intriguing, uh, to say the least. Uh, I think it's important to bear in mind whether this was just a communication gaffe, uh, what they're really talking about, or any kind of strategies or policies to facilitate a more competitive exchange rate versus an outright devaluation. You know, devaluation has a certain ominous sound to it to an economist. Uh, and it's intriguing simply because I don't think India necessarily needs it at this point. More importantly, given the rather you know, global slump that we have, as far as trade dynamics are concerned, it's unclear how much of a devaluation is really going to help. In fact, it could be costly in terms of how it spooks investors and has an impact on uh, capital flows. Um, so again, I would make a distinction. The government, of course, officials have denied it. Uh, there's a distinction between uh, getting together and discussing how to facilitate a more competitive exchange rate versus talking about an outright devaluation. I should point out uh, that this typical reliance on a weaker exchange rate to boost export competitiveness is really a non-starter for all practical purposes. Um, ultimately, what matters, and India has immense scope to deliver on this, is uh, really about uh, productivity gains and enhancing structural competitiveness. Um, I find it somewhat uh, puzzling that if indeed make in India and ease of doing business were being as successful as they are generally reported to be, uh, there should already be an inbuilt boost as far as the broader competitiveness for exporters are concerned. So, you know, it's difficult to marry the two potential scenarios, which obviously come from different parts of the government. No, so, you, so let, let me get this clear. You're saying that you understand the government's liking for a more competitive exchange rate. Uh, but essentially, you and others have a problem with the word devaluation, right? It doesn't quite fit right with how the well, rupee is managed here. There's, uh, you see, devaluation refers to a one-time, large, outsized, policy-driven move. Uh, that is not necessarily needed. Uh, you can still have a market-driven exchange rate that gravitate more towards uh, gradual weakness. Uh, rupee has actually been weakening for the last couple of years. Uh, you know, year to date, it might be pretty much uh, unchanged now, uh, but it is still a relative underperformer compared to other emerging currencies against the U.S. dollar. Um, I think the important point in all of this is how much a conscious targeting of weaker exchange rate is going to help exports. And the point I'm trying to emphasize is I think that would be a short-sighted strategy the greater focus, long-lasting focus, should be on enhancing productivity gains, which automatically will feed through into export volumes and will help the exchange rate as well. I mean, exchange rate should be thought of as a stabilizer, as a shock absorber, rather than becoming a you know, focal point, a target, as far as policy is concerned. Hi, Rajiv. Good morning. At current reckoning, is the rupee overvalued? And if yes, by how much? Well, uh, if you go by the officially released real effective exchange rates that the RBI puts out, uh, it's roughly around 10 to 12 percent overvalued, although in the last year or so, the magnitude of that overvaluation hasn't really changed. Uh, now, do bear in mind, rather than just running off with that number, um, given the fact that globally, uh, all uh, export-oriented cyclical economies are worse off automatically their currencies are going to be much weaker than India. Uh, so there's a built-in uh, profile because of the slump in global demand that actually makes rupee a bit more favorable, not to mention it is a high-yielding currency. So all of those factors come into play as well. Um, as and when the global economy recovers, automatically you will see a rebalancing. An exchange rate is a relative price. Uh, as and when that happens, export-oriented currencies would actually do better, and that uh, uh, overvaluation will automatically begin to come down. 
The area where India can actually do a fair amount in checking that overvaluation is really on relative inflation. Um, while we land up, uh, you know, thumping our chests about how much inflation has fallen, uh, what people ignore is India still has among the highest inflation rates. Uh, so from a relative inflation perspective, that would still point that there's a structural built-in built bias for the rupee to actually weaken. Rajiv, uh, you know, we live in extraordinary times, both in terms of monetary policy, actually mostly monetary policy. Now, uh, the focus is slowly now shifting to fiscal policy, right? I mean, uh, and that talk started after the, the last Thursday's ECB meeting. Chatter started, well, is, the, is this a start, start, a focus away from monetary to the fiscal? Uh, I'm not saying that, well, everybody is doing it, so we should also get into the game. Uh, but the point is, these are uh, extraordinary times. So I'm just asking you to kind of sort of consider these proposals in that context, uh, what your trading partners are doing and what you have to do to protect your competitiveness or even increase your competitiveness. I, that, uh, Prashant, that's a fair point, but don't forget, when we talk about uh, the extraordinary measures some of the developed countries are undertaking, uh, do also, uh, you know, put it in context of the extraordinary circumstances uh, they find themselves in post-crisis. Uh, India is not really in that situation. Um, you know, for an economy where there's a lot that can be done from a structural front, uh, to try and boost trend growth rate, that is really where the focus should be. Um, all these little, little things about, you know, currency weakness or extra fiscal push um, only soften the pressure point for a stronger push on structural front and at the margin actually may not make a, a big difference. So, you know, for India to justify a slower pace of fiscal consolidation because some developed countries that are, you know, in near recession conditions are doing it, uh, is not really all that uh, valid uh, for a country that's actually reportedly, at least, uh, official terms growing at uh, 7, 7.5%. Rajiv, uh, Rima and I have uh, many more questions, uh, so they're coming your way in just a bit. Request you to stay with us. We'll take a very quick break. Back in two. See you on the other side. ...with Rajiv Malik, the senior economist at CLSA. We've spoken about the rupee, but we've got a lot more questions for him. Um, Rajiv, uh, you know, just recently we got the inflation as well as the IIP data, and that has just strengthened the case for a rate cut by the new governor come 4th of October. What is your view? Are we expect should Will he, won't he? And if not in October, when do you think the next rate cut will come from the RBI and thereafter the trajectory? Well, the inflation print is more important than the IP print, uh, and I think the large reversal uh, in, in inflation pretty much sets the stage for a rate cut either in October, if not in October, then certainly in, in December. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's going to be Governor Patel's first policy meeting as governor in October. Um, there might be a bit of a cautious approach, wanting another reading just to confirm that trends are improving. Uh, but quite frankly, there's enough on the table for him to chew on and actually go ahead with a rate cut in October. Um, I do think uh, if that doesn't happen, then December is a much more likely option. But in any case, before year end, we will get uh, a rate cut. Uh, I do think that would be the last one. Um, while uh, inflation has come off and will come off further, do bear in mind what the central bank is going to be focusing much more on is whatever is the sustained inflation profile. Uh, India has a lot of volatility, uh, upside and downside, because of food-related prices. Um, and don't forget that even though the 5% uh, target for early 2017 uh, is uh, very much achievable, the 4% target, which is now legally binding, uh, is actually pretty ambitious. Uh, and I think that increasingly is going to begin to impact uh, the policy response. Um, one joker in the pack, of course, is going to be the composition of the MPC, since that will increasingly be deciding on rates. Uh, and we essentially only know part of the composition. Um, ultimately, the three nominees by the government will pretty much set the stage whether that MPC is actually a hard-hitting reform, much welcome, or just a paper tiger. Is there any reason to expect that uh, the government would want it to be a paper tiger? I mean, I think you wrote in your note after Dr. Urujit Patel was appointed as the governor uh, that uh, the government should be credited uh, for the appointment because it shows that the government understands the, the focus on inflation uh, that was there under uh, Governor Rajan. So any reason to oh, expect absolutely. that the government uh, would not want NPC 
to, to, to have teeth, essentially? Go on. Well, you know, it's in, uh, don't forget, it's in the government's own interest to have a credible MPC. Uh, rather than be swayed by certain short-term myopia about having an MPC which has a much more dovish tone and therefore can facilitate a few rate cuts. I mean, ultimately, uh, everyone is on the same side of ensuring that inflation remains low and stable, and it's very much work in progress as far as India is concerned. Um, uh, you know, uh, which way it goes, we don't know. That's precisely why it should be announced sooner rather than uh, later. Uh, but one potential uh, thought process could easily be that there's a hawkish governor. Uh, the MPC composition could be a bit on the dovish side just to balance it out. I don't know. Uh, there are different permutations, combinations that potentially could be explored. Uh, but it is very important for policymakers to appreciate that a credible MPC uh, is actually what is needed for everyone on the same side. Rajiv, we started off, uh, you know, the monsoon, uh, you know, expecting a good monsoon, a normal one, but it's turning out to be a deficient one. Will it hamper the growth rates? Would you cut down your growth estimates for India because of a deficient monsoon? Um, no, I think you know, the aggregate numbers uh, may not be as uh, perky as uh, going into the season people might have initially wished for. Uh, and, you know, for all, all the supply constraints India has, wishes are always in excess supply. Uh, but I think overall profile has still been uh, pretty decent. It's certainly better than what we've had in the last couple of years. Uh, so, no, I don't think growth forecasts necessarily are going to be shaped because of that. Um, I, you could still see over the next uh, year or so as the GDP deflator sings a different tone, uh, real growth being adjusted lower. Uh, but that's a separate story altogether. Fair enough. Uh, just to uh, revisit that point, you said that one cut this year in October or either December and then a very long pause. That's what you said, right? I, yes. I mean, uh, ultimately, we have to appreciate that part of the inflation targeting framework, uh, even though it's flexible inflation targeting, that 4% target uh, is actually pretty ambitious. Uh, when you put in context any kind of potential recovery in a largely supply-constrained economy, um, and to the extent that later on corporate pricing power also begins to emerge, of course, much later in cycle, uh, it'll be extremely, extremely difficult to deliver on that 4% target. And ultimately, the success of achieving that target, frankly, is not with the RBI. It's actually with the government and its uh, supply-side uh, uh, reform initiatives. What RBI has to ensure with its interest rate policy is to make sure that the demand side and the supply side are in sync. Uh, you know, people often get swayed in, with all kinds of naughty arguments about interest rates in India. Uh, but really, that's what RBI is effectively trying to do. Rajiv, global bond yields have been rising. In fact, they've risen to the highest level since the Brexit day. What are your global counterparts talking with respect to, you know, sh will we see more QE from the likes of Japan as well as from ECB, as well as on the Fed? Well, I think it's interesting. I mean, if you put that uh, observation that you just made about higher bond yields in the context that U.S. numbers at least have been weaker, uh, you know, so you have a combination where uh, Fed Fed's futures pricing of uh, rate increase in September has actually gone down, uh, but long rates in the U.S. have actually crept up, at least more recently, even yesterday. Uh, the weak uh, retail sales print uh, just had, you know, a very marginal impact, uh, which was quite uh, surprising as far as yields were concerned. Um, I think ultimately there's a certain volatility uh, which uh, nobody really seems to have a good handle on. Uh, it can be somewhat worrying because it's just being driven by a variety of different factors. Uh, but yes, that is something clearly to look out for and be, be on the watch. Mm. No, uh, so, so as a, <clears throat> from a top-down perspective, what is your view? Are we, expect, are we going to see QE infinity? I'm not talking about the Fed, but generally uh, from big central banks around the world. More, you know, people keep second-guessing, well, so it's not work, why would they do more? But there's no other option in a way. The wiggle room is very little. Go on. Well, I think there are, there are two options. I mean, uh, you know, when you think about Japan, for example, I think uh, fiscal response probably is going to make a bigger difference than another monetary response. Uh, with with uh, uh, ECB and uh, the Fed, 
the function is going to be very much in terms of how the existing measures are necessarily playing out. I mean, Draghi tried to douse expectations uh, about any extension as far as QE is concerned. Uh, I would actually be very surprised if he doesn't. Uh, U.S. obviously in a different stage as far as its own cycle is concerned. Here the question has really been about pushing out Fed rate uh, expectations <coughs> and given the tone of numbers, uh, that is a reasonable response. Uh, I think there's, there's this perception that somehow central banks know exactly how things are going to pan out over the next couple of years. They don't, uh, which is precisely why they are so data uh, focused. Uh, and data itself has been quite volatile. I mean, U.S. certainly, uh, if you just see by how Fed right. rate... Rajiv, actually, actually on that point, uh, I think the all pervasive view is that everyone now recognizes that, recognizes that central banks have no idea on how things are going to pan out a few years down the line. But we're on this road that we can't, we don't have I, exits on, basically. I mean, that's, that's the more recent no, view over I, the last I mean, couple of years, yes. That, that, that's that's uh, somewhat harsh, uh, Prashant. I mean, uh, bear in mind, we're very much in no man's land. We're in a situation where uh, none of the policymakers have experienced this before. Uh, so the question is, do you not do anything? Do you try sure. out something, even if you're unsure about the consequences eventually? Um, so different things will be tried out. Is it uh, one bold experiment that can horribly go wrong? Sure. Uh, but the cost has to be seen in terms of not doing anything, especially if the political uh, setting is uh, not being as constructive as perhaps it should be. Uh, you know, there's only so much monetary policy or monetary measures can actually do. Uh, and while we're talking about developed countries, I would bring it back to India uh, with the kind of obsession about, uh, you know, pushing rates lower. Uh, well, it can't happen in isolation. Fix inflation uh, and you will see a structural decline in interest rates. Rajiv, thank you very much uh, for your time. It's a pleasure as always and hope to see you back on soon. Thanks indeed. Thank you for the conversation. We'll slip into, slip into a very quick break. We return and uh, we discuss market technicals. Ashwini Gujral of AshwiniGujral.com is going to be joining in and he's going to run us through uh, what he makes of the market here and now. Big game.